Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Word of the Lord. James over here with you. Thank you for staying tuned after What Does the Bible Say? If you ask What Does the Bible Say, you'll always get a word from the Lord. And we are so glad that you have chosen to take your time this evening. I know it's pretty bad outside here in uh, Rockingham County. We came through some pretty torrential rains up there in uh, Eden. And uh, it was coming on down, but we're glad that you are safe and dry inside, and uh, we hope that you will have your Bibles ready for the study of God's Word. Thank you, brother. Uh, our, our content information, to the Boulevard, Eden, North Carolina. We have our Bible studies Sundays at 10 and 11 a.m., and also Thursday nights at 7 p.m. In Martinsville, if you're in Martinsville, Wednesday nights at 7 p.m., and uh, in Danville, it's Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Here's the contact information if you want to meet, uh, reach the brethren up there. They'll be glad to study the Bible with you and uh, uh, come out and meet you, answer your Bible questions, uh, anything that we can do for you. We want to be a servant to you, especially when it comes to your soul salvation. Uh, sometimes people call us for physical needs, and we try to help them out when we can. But our primary goal, friends, is to help you with your spiritual needs, and uh, that is really what we are, are here for. And so uh, we want to do that very thing. I uh, want to remind you also of uh, Religious Review coming up at 10.30 after the news. So we'll let Mark Childry get his little FaceTime in, and then we will uh, come back with the Religious Review. There's uh, uh, Mark and Michael will be coming back on doing Religious Review tonight, I believe, and uh, discussing more of uh, uh, some of the information they've been giving you. So stay tuned for Religious Review. Thursday night lineup, a uh, good way to spend your Thursday evening. Just pop pop you some corn and sit back and with your Bible and pen and paper or whatever and uh, <clears throat> study God's Word with us. want to uh, also welcome those of you who are watching in, in Michigan. Uh, folks in Michigan, if you are, uh, uh, if you're unaware about it, uh, starting next Wednesday, let me go ahead and plug their tent meeting, next Wednesday up in, uh, is it Ludington? Yes. In Ludington, uh, they're having a tent meeting. Uh, and uh, it's going on, starts Wednesday through Sunday. That's the 13th through the, through the 17th. So, uh, folks, uh, we're being seen up in Muskegon, so drive on up uh, and, uh, and visit the tent meeting. Uh, Brother Kevin uh, Pendergrass is doing the preaching, and the brethren up there will be glad to see you. Uh, Brother Steve Bayston, Scott Claps, and some of the other brethren will be glad to, to see you there and uh, hope that you will... Uh, uh, take advantage of that. Some of the brethren from down here are coming up there. So if you're watching uh, this broadcast up in in, uh, <clears throat> in uh, Muskegon, uh, you might see some faces that you know from the TV. So come up and, uh, and, and visit the tent meeting, ask your questions, no collections. Uh, that's the way it is in the Church of Christ. We don't want your money. Uh, we just we want your attention. Uh, you can leave your billfolds and bring your Bibles. That's, uh, that's just the way we operate. So Hope that you will do that. Speaking of money, speaking of money, you know we've been offering this this reward here, a thousand dollars reward for <clears throat> anyone who can find biblical authority, biblical authority for man-made churches. That's denominations. The only one kind of church in this book. We want we want biblical authority for the things that are not in this book, uh, like the Church of God denomination. Uh, the uh, Baptist Church, Methodist Church, the Lutheran Church, the Presbyterian Church. These are things we want authority for. $1,000 reward for uh, uh, born in sin. The idea that you're born in sin. Find it in the Bible. Show us in the Bible where you're born in sin. $1,000 reward. Uh, saved or justified by faith only. <clears throat> in other words, an alien sinner. You've never been in a relationship with God. Show us how your sins are removed just by faith only. And that dovetails in with the next one there, the sinner's prayer, the alien sinner's prayer. Someone who's never been in a relationship with God, where in the Bible do you ever hear about someone saying, uh, well, you know, in order to become a child of God, just say the sinner's prayer and, you, and then now you're in a relationship with God. Find that in the Bible. These are the things we've been offering for some time now. And, and uh, you know what we got in the mail during the tent meeting? Uh, I guess uh, last week or sometime, I don't remember the exact date when it came, <clears throat> but we actually have someone who's going to claim that reward. Now, in the past, we've had people who claim this reward. And uh, I know one gentleman says, well, he found the church of God in the Bible. Well, whoop de doo we know that's in the Bible. It's the, same, it's the same kind of church as the church of Christ in the Bible. 
Matter of fact, it's the same kind of church as the, the one body or the bride of Christ in the Bible. The church of the firstborn. These are all the same kind of church. They belong to the same, uh, they follow the same doctrine. They teach the same thing. They believe the same thing. They practice the same thing. And so it's still one kind of, of doctrine. If I tell you there's one store in town, I don't have to tell you its name. There's only one store. If there was only one store and uh, in town, I'd say, well, go down to the store. You wouldn't have to ask, is it Target or Walmart? You wouldn't have to ask that because there's only one kind of store. Just like amongst all stores, there's only one Walmart. Now, you know what? I hear people call Walmart uh, different things. I even call it Wally War, Wally World. You know, well, I know what they're talking about. They're talking about Walmart. I hear some people, and my, my family teases me, I say Walmarts. You know, well, they know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the one kind of Walmart. Still the same, uh, 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 same place. So what we're talking about is we're talking about finding biblical authority for these things. And someone has written a letter and even sent a DVD to explain why they should earn or they have, uh, uh, should be given the reward. Now, here's the letter. It's from a man named uh, Ernest D. Uh, Hopkins. Now I don't know if it's the same. If it's the same uh, 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 Hopkins here, but in the past I've actually had uh, dealings with an E. D. Hopkins, and uh, I, I'm I'm guessing it may be the same same person, and that's fine. That's fine. He's keep trying for the for the prize. That's good. That's good. He's working for it, which I know he wouldn't be. He wouldn't be far. Uh, he didn't like the idea of works, but nonetheless, he's, try he's trying to, to earn this $1,000. But here's the letter. It's a three-page letter and a DVD. Now, I'm going to tell you tonight, folks, there's so much good stuff in this letter. We're not even going to get to the DVD tonight. You have to stay tuned for that next week. Next week, we're going to do the DVD, talk about some of the things on the DVD. I just didn't have time to process it all. It's just so much good information, good teaching material in this letter from Mr. Hopkins, Mr. E.D. Hopkins, and uh, we're going to go through, really we're probably gonna get, only going to get to the first page. That's just how much good information that Mr. Hopkins is giving us to teach you and to show you the fallacy of what man-made doctrine do, uh, can do for you. Now, here's the letter. We're going to take this kind of paragraph by paragraph. Some of these paragraphs we kind of have out of order because they kind of go uh, uh, they they go better together in a different order. But let's start off with the first first paragraph. Now here he says he says you offer a thousand dollar proof for uh, that the change takes place before we are baptized. Faith comes by hearing. This is before we are baptized. This proves we have an inward faith before we are baptized. Listed below are several more scripture references to prove the change is before we are baptized. Now, let's stop and talk about this for a minute. All right. He wants $1,000 for proof that the change takes place before you're baptized. Now, I don't know what the change is that he's talking about. Let's, get, let's define the terms here, friends. We're talking about salvation, the remission of sins. That's what we're talking about. And we're saying that we want biblical authority for the fact that salvation, the remission of sins, that God removes your sins and removes them from your, from your charge, removes them from your account. He's not going to lay you, cause you to be guilty or, or count you guilty for those sins. After, or, excuse me, or before baptism. Now the Bible clearly teaches that salvation takes place after baptism. But Mr. Hopkins wants to say that it's before. Now he says faith is before baptism. Therefore he has proof. Well friends, stop and think about it. Have you ever heard us say, have you ever heard us say that faith does not come before baptism? Have you not been listening? Friends, Jesus said take heed how you hear and I think Mr. Hopkins needs to really listen to that. Take heed how you hear. You never heard us say that salvation takes place after baptism but before you have faith. See, that doesn't prove your point. 
He says, this proves we have faith before baptism. Well, hey, that's what we believe. We believe you have faith before you're baptized. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, Hebrews 11, verse 6, listen to what? Uh, let's, let me get my Bible up here. Hebrews 11, 6, listen to what the Hebrew writer says about faith. All right? Some of you may know this by heart. That's all right. We want to put it up there. Uh, this is Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, friend, listen. Faith comes before anything you do to please God. You see that? We, we never said that faith doesn't uh, come before baptism. I don't know what he's trying to think he's proven by saying, well, this proves that you have faith before you're baptized. Before, before you're baptized. Well, whoop de do. You haven't proven anything. That, we all know that. We never said find us proof that faith comes before baptism. See, friends, the problem that Mr. Hopkins has and the problem that so many people have is he thinks that just because he's found faith before baptism and then he believes that faith only is what saves you, therefore he thinks he's found proof that you're saved before baptism. Friends, that hasn't proven anything. That's just proven that he doesn't know how to reason from the scriptures. That's all that's proven. No one ever heard us say, no one ever heard us say, that faith does not come before baptism. Faith clearly comes before baptism. Faith comes before anything. Faith comes before you will repent. Faith comes before you will confess Christ. Faith comes before anything that is pleasing to God. Anything you do that's pleasing to God, you've got to have faith in order to do that. Now, many of you folks out there have it, have it backwards. Y'all want to say you repent and then you have faith. Now, that's backwards. Now, if that person was offering $1,000, Mr. Hopkins, you could go find that. You could go give your birth and say, hey, give me $1,000 because I have where faith is going to come before repentance. Now, I wish some of the Baptist folks in our, in our neighborhood, I wish they would make that offer because they're the ones who teach you repent and then you have faith. So why don't they offer the $1,000 to someone who can find faith before repentance and we'd all cash in on it. See that? But here we have, here's a man who says, well, this proves you have faith before baptism. Friends, we have always believed and always taught because the Bible teaches that faith comes before baptism. You haven't proven anything by that. But now, listen to what he says. He says, well, I have proved that faith before baptism uh, exists, therefore, that's proof that you're saved. Friends, that doesn't prove you're saved before baptism. That just proves you have faith before baptism. But if it is the case that salvation takes place at the point of faith and before baptism, if that's true, then what are you going to do with these verses? Look at this. In John 12 and verse 42. John 12, 42. All right. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of synagogue. Now here we have some folks who definitely believed. They believed on Jesus. Now, Mr. Hopkins, because he's so wrapped up in you have faith and there's when your sins are forgiven and that's when you have, I'll use his term, the change take place. I, I, I really don't know what that means. I don't know why he doesn't just use the term salvation. Maybe because he knows that the Bible doesn't teach that. So he has to, to modify it. I, I don't know. But here it is. Here's some chief rulers that believed on Jesus, but they would not confess him. Now, if you're saved at the point of faith, why aren't these folks saved? Or, or are they saved? 
I would like to hear Mr. Hopkins tell us these people are saved. Are they saved? They believe. They believe, but they won't confess Christ. Oh, but they believe. They believe. Say, friends, just because you've proven that faith comes before baptism, you haven't proven that it is what saves you or that you're saved at the point of faith because if it were the case, now let's reason together, if it were the case, you've got these folks here in John 12, 42 that are believing on Jesus and you have to save them, but they won't confess Christ. Now what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? Because Jesus says that if you won't confess him, he won't confess you. Now, I don't know why Mr. Hopkins then thinks that, that he's accomplished something because in reality, all he's proven, again, all he's proven is that, uh, is that he's uh, not reasoning in the scripture together. All right? Or not reasoning correctly. All right? Now, uh, let's see. In Mark 16, Mark 16, 16, Jesus says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, friends, we've asked this a number of times, and those who are honest, those who are honest, recognize it. Those who aren't and are stuck where Mr. Hopkins are, they have a problem with this verse. Mark 16, 16, Jesus says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now, friends, why does Jesus have to say, if you're not baptized, you'll be damned? Your own doctrine says that if you don't believe, you won't be saved. Why does he have to go through all the trouble of saying, he that believeth not and is baptized not shall be damned? Look, if you don't believe, if you don't do the first thing, you're not going to do anything that comes after that. He doesn't have to go through and say what's going to happen if you don't do it and point out every little thing because he's told you what you must do in order to obtain salvation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. See? So, if I told you, he that puts gas and oil in his car won't break down. But he that doesn't, he that won't put gas in his car, you know, will break down. I don't have to say everything that you have to do in order to uh, I don't have to say everything that will happen if you don't do it. It's obvious if you don't do everything that's required for salvation, then the result is going to be you're going to be damned. If you won't do the very first thing, you're going to be damned. Belief in this verse comes before baptism and it comes before salvation. Now, Mr. Hopkins, why? Why won't you accept the fact that belief and baptism come before salvation. Why didn't Jesus say, he that believeth and is saved shall be baptized? Now we've asked this question a number of times. If this verse does not teach that belief and baptism both come before salvation, if it doesn't teach that, how would Jesus say it in order to make it mean belief and baptism comes before salvation? How would he say it? How would he say it? See, friends, there is no other way to say these words and make it mean belief and baptism come before salvation any, there's no other way except the way that Jesus said it. And you know why he said it that way? Because that's what he meant. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now he doesn't have to tell you, well, if you're not, if you don't, if not baptized, you're going to be damned. Well, of course not, because you don't even believe. And you yourself know that you're going to be
going to be lost if you don't believe. You see, friends, when you when you're all tied up in one little verse or one doctrine, faith only, you're going to read. Anytime someone has faith, you're going to read them being saved. And friends, the Bible says in James two nineteen, the devils believe and tremble. Now you're going to have them. You're going to have them saved. You got the devils. And you got the uh, the chief uh, scribe in John twelve forty two, all believing, but yet you don't want them saved. You don't want them saved. So, what about faith without confessing Jesus as Christ? Well, there's faith. Faith comes before baptism. That's proof that you're saved at the point of faith. Well, here's faith before confessing Christ. Is that proof that you're saved too? Something you think about, friends. Has he really earned his thousand dollars? Has he really done what the challenge is? I think not. I think not. He hasn't proven anything. All right. Now listen to this. In Acts 2, verse 38, here's what he says. He says, in Acts 2, 38, Peter tried to bring in an Old Testament practice or ordinance into the New Testament period. You are doing the same thing. Jesus told Peter, he did not savor the things of God, but man, but of man. In one passage, he called Peter Satan. Why do you not follow Peter? Did you hear that? Peter tried to bring in an Old Testament uh, practice. He tried to bring in an Old Testament order into the New Testament period. Friends, you hear what the man say? Peter tried to do it. In Acts 2.38, when Peter said, Repent and be baptized, everyone of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, Mr. Hopkins says that Peter was trying to bring something into the New Testament that he should have left in the Old Testament. Tell you what, you may have an argument, Mr. Hopkins, but if you want to make that argument, why don't you make it to all your denominational friends that want to bring in the tithing and the pianos and the incense and everything else into the worship? Because they're definitely trying to bring something from the Old Testament into the New Testament. But you don't say much about that, do you? But to say that Peter was trying to bring in something, and then to say that Peter was the devil, that he was Satan. He was savoring things of, of man and not of God. Listen, in Acts 2, Acts 2 verse uh, 1, Acts 2, listen to what? Listen to this. I suggest you go back and read your Bible, Mr. Hopkins. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound of, from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it, uh, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, Mr. Hopkins, Mr. Hopkins says that in Acts 2.38... You know, just some 30-some verses later that Peter is trying to bring in something from the Old Testament. Well, he was speaking by the Holy Spirit, Mr. Hopkins. He was speaking by the Holy Spirit. Everything they were saying was, was because the Holy Spirit was giving them utterance. And then if we skip on down to verse 14 where Peter and the others are, are standing up, they're being mocked, now listen to what Peter says. Listen to what Peter said. Peter standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken unto my words. These men are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing that it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids, headmaids, will I pour out in those days of my spirit, 
and they shall prophesy. And I'll show you wonders in heaven and signs and earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. Uh, and the sun shall be turned into uh, darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then he goes into another part of the sermon talking about proof that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. And when he gets down to the end of that sermon, verse 37, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter, after having been spoke, have, after having uh, spoke by the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit gave him utterance, and Peter, as uh, uh, after having said all that by inspiration, stops and brings in something because he savors the things of men and not of God, and brings in an Old Testament practice. Are you kidding me, Mr. Hopkins? Are you? Are, are you really so determined that you're going to hold to a man-made doctrine that you're going to say that Peter, when the Bible says we're speaking of inspiration, that Peter was trying to bring in something from the Old Testament because he was the devil? Peter wrote almost half, uh, uh, he wrote two books in the Bible and half the book of Acts is talking about him. And you're saying, why would you want to follow Peter? I say, why not follow Peter? Why not follow Peter? What do you have against Peter? He's speaking by inspiration. I'll tell you why you don't want to follow Peter. Because you are so rebellious and hard-hearted that you're going to say, well, you know what? He teaches something I don't like. I'm not going to follow him. Well, that's all right. You, that's your prerogative. And you want to say that we're teaching false doctrine because you won't follow Peter? I'll tell you what, I'll stand beside Peter on the day of judgment. I'll stand beside Peter and say, I did exactly what Peter said. And Mr. Hopkins standing over there, he can stand by somebody, but I bet they're going to clear out from him like, 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 they, like he got the leprosy. I'll tell you what, on the day of judgment, you go stand by Peter, and Peter's going to say, man, I want close to you. You fit to be cast away. Saying that Peter was the devil. Let's read it again. Let me read it again to you. He says, Jesus told Peter he did not savor the things of God but of man. Was that what Peter was doing? Inputting his own savoriness? Is that what he was doing? The things that he savored, he was bringing them in? In one passage he called Peter Satan. Now why would you bring that up, Mr. Hopkins? Unless, unless you're trying to discredit what Peter is saying in Acts 2.38. Now look at this. He says, why would, in one passage you call Peter Satan, why would you want to follow Peter? Well, listen. In Acts, let's look at this. In Matthew 16.23, Matthew 16, verse 23, this is where Jesus says to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. For thou art an offense unto me, thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Now you mean to tell me that this rebuke by Jesus meant that anything that Peter did was going to be tainted and that we shouldn't listen to it because he savored not the things of God in this particular instance? Why don't you look at the context, Mr. Hopkins? Why don't you look at the context? Peter is rebuking Jesus saying that it is not going to be for him to be crucified. Let's back up. Verse 21, Matthew 16, 21. And that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go into Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders, chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised again the third day. And Peter began to rebuke him. And that's why Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan. You're savoring not the things of God but of men. Because Peter was trying to keep Jesus from doing his will, the thing that he meant to do. But you, Mr. Hopkins, are trying to convince this community that Peter was savoring the things of men when he was bringing in this Old Testament practice of baptism, and therefore we should not follow Peter. I'll tell you what, I don't know who sounds more like Satan. It ain't Peter. And back up this. Let's back on up a few more verses. This
this is right after Peter has made the great confession. In verse six, uh, Matthew 16, 16, look what, Jesus, what Peter said. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed be art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Well, I guess Peter was speaking from the devil that was in him when he made that confession too, wasn't he? Come on, people. Mr. Hopkins, are you really that dishonest? Are you really that dishonest? Now look at this. Here's the result of Mr. Hopkins' doctrine. He wants those who did not confess Christ saved because they believed. In John 12, 42. He'd have to say they were saved because they, they believed. But they wouldn't confess. And now he has Peter who did confess Christ. He's calling him Satan. Now what's wrong with that picture? He says Peter did not savor the things of God even though he confessed Christ. And the chief priest or the chief uh, the scribe, they wouldn't confess Christ, but hey, they had to be saved because they were believed. They believed. Now, friends, I tell you what, Mr. Hopkins, he deserves a reward, and God's gonna give it to him, but it's not a thousand dollars. But he's gonna get a reward unless you repent of this mess. All because you're trying to twist the scriptures and make it fit your little man-made doctrine. Not happening, Mr. Hopkins. Not happening. Not happening. Now, let's get one more paragraph. Let's get one more paragraph here. And uh, I think it's pretty good here. Here he says, The Campbellites reject the doctrine of the Bible which gives God and Jesus Christ all honor for our salvation, redemption, and the promise of eternal life. Now, friends, we give God all the glory for that. We give God all the glory for his infinite wisdom, his great love, his great mercy, and the grace that brings salvation to all men. But here's why he says it. He says we reject that doctrine because it's done without our works or choice. Now think about that, Dr. Friend. Mr. Hopkins says that our salvation, our redemption, the promise of eternal life is all done without our works or our choice. Seriously, without our choice? Uh, do you mean to tell me you mean to tell me that the things that that we do in this life that we don't have the uh, we don't have a choice we don't have a say in uh, in our salvation you mean to tell me that everything that we do is because uh, God has foreordained it to the point that we have no Say in the matter? Salvation without works, without our works of choice. Friends, I say that's a lazy man's religion. That's a lazy man's religion. Look at this. He says, he might as well, this might, might as well be Mr. Hopkins. I did nothing to become a sinner because he was born in sin, right? That's what, that's what they say, born in sin. I did nothing to be saved because God did it for me. And I can't do nothing to lose my salvation. I might as well lay here on the couch, eat, drink, and be merry because there ain't nothing I can do about anything. I was born a sinner and God, if he so chose to save me, is going to save me and I can do nothing to lose that salvation. Now friends, is that really what the Bible teaches Here's what Mr. Hopkins says. He says, this is the doctrine. Let me get my paper here. And that was as large as I can, I can uh, get that. This is the doctrine the Bible teaches. Why don't you Campbellite preachers preach this doctrine? I'll tell you why I don't preach the doctrine you're saying because it's not in the Bible. John, 4, John, uh, John 6, 44. No man can come 
to me except the Father which sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. If the Father draws you to Christ, who makes the choice? Well, that's very interesting. Let's put the scripture up there. Let's put the scripture up there. In John chapter 6 and verse 44, no man come to Father except uh, uh, no man come to me except the Father which hath sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now why don't you read the next verse and find out how God draws people. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Now, Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father draw me. Uh, except the Father which has sent me draw him. So God has to draw. Now Jesus explains how the drawing takes place. Somebody has to hear and somebody has to learn and then they can come to Christ. Well, that, to me, that sounds like I have a part in that. Sounds to me like I have a choice if I'm going to learn, if I'm going to hear. Why did Jesus say, take heed how you hear? Why didn't they say back to him, well, Jesus, don't you know that we, can't, we don't have a choice in hearing because, you know, we don't have a choice in the matter. We, we don't have any free will here. It's not our choice. If we're going to hear, it's because God wants us to hear it. And if we don't hear it, it's because God doesn't want us to hear it. So if we're not drawn to you, Jesus, it's because God doesn't want us to be drawn to him. We don't have a choice in the matter, Remember? Then he says, let me, let me get this other, let's see if we get a, another uh, uh, rest of this verse up here. Romans 2, verse 4. The goodness of God leadeth to repentance, he says. If God leadeth you to repentance, who makes the choice? Well, let's see if that's exactly what the, what the scripture says. Romans 2, verse 4. Let's look at this. He says, Paul says, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Now, is that what Mr. Uh, Hopkins says? He says God leads you to repentance. That's not what the verse says. It says the goodness of God leads you to repentance. It's the mercy of God that ought to motivate you to repent. So just because God puts some... Uh, uh, blessings out here and God shows his goodness that's what ought to lead you to repentance but God is not the one who's leading you to repentance in the sense of he's directly pulling you or pushing you friends do you stop and think about what this doctor is actually teaching think about it if someone doesn't repent where does the blame fall it has to be on God you go talk to someone and say, you need to repent. Well, we can't repent because God hasn't drawn me to repentance. He hasn't led me to repentance. So when I die and go to hell, it's going to be God's fault. Jesus said, except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. Luke 13, verse 3. I tell you, neighbor, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And they said unto him, Jesus, how can we repent until God leads us to repentance? Come on. Mr. Hopkins, are you really that dishonest? Are you really so dishonest that you're going to say that we can't repent unless God leads us to repentance? And so if we don't repent, it's God's fault. Well, I would want to repent, but I can't because God hasn't let me repent. Friends, all that means is God has given you the opportunity. He's given you the word that will convict you. He's given you the, the, the charge to repent. Acts 17, verse 30. Let's look at this again. Acts 17, verse 30. Here's Paul. He said that at the time of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. But don't you realize, Paul, that men can't repent even though it's a command because God hasn't led them to repentance? Who makes the choice here? They have no choice in repentance. What if it's no choice? Why give the command? If you're going to do it, because God has foreordained that you do it, why give the command? Why waste the time writing all this book knowing that only a set group of people are going, to re are going to hear it and some are not? Some are going to receive it and some are not because God has, has chosen for you. Now is that really 
what, what we're believing here? You're on the word of the Lord. You're on the word of the Lord. You're on the word of the Lord. Call her. Go on to the phone lines. Go on once. You there? Call her. <clears throat> okay. Now, so who has the choice here, friends? Who has the choice here? See, he wants you to believe that you don't have a choice in the matter because then you'd be doing something. See how ridiculous that is? They don't want to do something so badly that they make God have to do all the work. But what you've got to realize, friends, if you hold on to that doctrine, you're going to make God condemn everybody who doesn't repent. You're going to, condemn, you're going to make God be the one who is the guilty person for all these individuals who are lost because, after all, they're lost because he didn't do something wrong. Let me tell you, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I think God did plenty on his part. You want him to come down and hold your hand and lead you and move you and make you feel such a way that you're going to obey the gospel? I say you're lazy. That's what I say. Don't want to do anything. You want to work in the Lord? Hello? Hello? Yes, can you put up Psalms uh, 51 8? Okay. And what's your point while we're getting there? Make you, Go ahead and make, state, your, state your case. What about born, being born into sin? Okay. Psalm 51 8. Yeah. Here we go. Make me to hear the joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Not the verse you're looking for, I don't think, is it? No. No. Well, what, 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 what do you... It says uh, a woman that is con it said she is con she's conceived in sin. Okay. So you you say we're not born in sin. It's it's taken in this verse. It was conceived in sin. Well, let's let's see here. I think I think the verse you're looking for is verse five, isn't it? I was shaping in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Five, five, yeah. Okay. But does that say that he was born in sin or that he was shaping in iniquity? In sin did his mother conceive him? Or was she was she sinning when she conceived? Yeah. That's actually what it is. Yeah. He wasn't born a sinner. He wasn't born a sinner. It, his mother conceived him in sin. If I said, if I said in drunkenness the man beat his wife, was his wife drunk or was the man? Okay. So we're not... We're not talking about the wife or beating a man or, or whatever. We're talking about. Do you are you so, preaching out? The, you preaching out the New Testament? No, we're in the Old Testament. That's where Psalms is. I'm saying, do you preach out the New Testament? Well, sure I do. Okay. But you went, but you took me to Psalms. Yeah. Okay. Okay. They were thought that uh, do. Uh, let's see. Do, do you? Uh, can you show me where the Church of Christ is mentioned in the Bible? Okay, now, are we going to, we, we're jumping to another place? We're satisfied with that. Romans 16, 16 says, the churches of Christ salute you. The church is, 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 is where at now? Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. 
that's the churches of Christ. Okay. It don't say it. It just says the churches of Christ. Okay. It don't say any kind of. If, that's if, all it says. If you've got more than one, if you've got more than one, isn't there one? If I said I have some apples, do I have at least one? Well, what I'm saying is, you can have you can have other other preachers out here preaching out of the Bible, but they're not preaching the same thing, sir. Paul said I preach the same thing in all churches, well, and they don't preach the same thing. You you can pull up the let's see. Timothy 2, 5, and the Holy Spirit is not the only administrator. What is it? Timothy 2, 5, and the Holy Spirit is not the only administrator. Only administrator. So what's your point in that? The point okay. being, that's what I'm saying. You read the Bible, and you can, it, 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 you're talking about all these doctrines, <laughs> and most most I've been in the, uh, to a few churches, you know. I mean, everybody's trying to teach the same thing, and a lot of people take it differently. Is what I'm trying to say. Well, they may take it differently, but there's still only one right way to to understand it. God meant it one way. Just because men take it differently doesn't mean there's doesn't mean that men are right. Well, I, I don't mean right? this in, in the wrong way, but what you what you're saying, I don't mean you. Uh, why, why does it say that you that you're right? What you're saying? Well, because I, I'm I, I, because I, I, it agrees. Here, because, right. All right, sir. Because it agree because it agrees with what we're saying in other places. What you're saying I'm not, does not agree with other things. All right. No, like we're talking about this, we're, sir. Like we're talking about. We were talking about Mr. Hopkins here. Mr. Hopkins said that we don't have any choice in our salvation. That God leads us to repentance and, and so forth. Now, if if I find in the Bible where where God commands us to do something, then it seems to me like I have a choice in the matter. Either I do it or I don't do it. Now that shows me that His doctrine is wrong because it contradicts the Bible in another place. That that's why I know that that it's right because it contradicts the Bible in another place. Well, if you go into that length, you know you've got you offered a thousand dollars to find that. You know what? When you offered a thousand dollars to find a certain thing in the Bible, you know that's gambling. I mean, you can you can put anything out of, out of context. Well, that that that's not gambling. You say what you say? That's yeah. When you offer some money, that's for somebody to find something. What is that? That's not gambling. I'm just I'm offering a reward. If I if I told you if I told you you come to my house and do a job, I'll pay you. What is that? Is that gambling? No, How about, you're trying to put, you, that's what I'm saying. You're saying to find something in the Bible that it, that the other doctrines teach. You know what? What I don't understand is is everybody's trying to get to the same place. No. Well, it may be, but sir, the, but that's not gambling. That's not gambling. That's not gambling. That's not gambling, sir. That's not gambling, sir. All right. Uh, you know, uh, we're kind of going in circles with this guy. But see, friends, what we're saying, we're talking about individuals who teach a doctrine uh, that contradicts what the Bible is saying in another place. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Here, here's a man who says that God has to lead your repentance. Now, let's look at this. In Acts 13... In verse 43. Now, whose choice is it? That's what we're dealing with. Acts 13 and verse 43. Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. All right? And uh, let's come on down. The Jews saw the multitude that were filled with envy and spake against those things which, which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first be spoken unto you, but seeing you put it from yourselves and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. All right? Uh, 
For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have sent thee a lie to the Gentiles, thou shalt be salvation in the earth. And when the Gentiles heard it, heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Now, does that mean that God has specified that these people are going to be saved specifically? Or was it that they had been ordained to eternal life because they heard the word, the gospel of their salvation? Paul said in Romans 116, the gospel is the power of God to salvation. So they had a choice in this matter. They had a choice in this matter. You ought to word my Lord. All right? So, uh, uh, so, so was, it the, was it the case that they didn't have any choice but to be saved? Or was it that they heard the gospel and, and were saved? James 1 verse 21 says that it's the word, the engrafted word that can save your souls. You on the word of the Lord? Hey, James, how's it going? It's all right. How are you? I'm fine. Uh, going back to what this Hopkins guy said that he didn't have to do anything. Yeah. Uh, what? Could you pull up Luke 646? Luke 646. Yes, sir. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? I guess he would say that, well, these people are the ones who are ordained to do what he says or not. I, I don't know. It just doesn't make any sense. It don't make any sense. No. Sure doesn't. It, they, they think they don't have to do anything. Right. I, I, I'm, a, I'm a builder, you know, and I, I like to think about the rest of that, that chapter there, you know, where they talk about the, this man, you know, it was like a, a house with no foundation. Um, you know, there's just no way that you have to do anything. Otherwise, what was Christ talking about right there? Yeah. I, I, he, he, apparently, there's something that they have to do. That's right. Yeah. So. It's like with repenting. I mean, you know, I like to think as a builder, you know, I, I think of things in the extreme. In other words, if, if I'm thinking about a weight coming down on a wall or something, I think about a big old tank or something up there, right? And right. it's bearing down on that wall. Okay, so let's think of that uh, in the extreme. If you were going to repent, uh, let's uh, take a, a heroin addict. Would he have to work at it to repent? Uh, no, no. If he if he repented, it'd be because God caused him to do it. <laughs> it's kind of silly, isn't it? Yeah. It, it's yeah, stupid. exactly. And but this, this other guy, though, that called in and was talking about born in sin. Yeah. Well, if he wants to read in Psalms there, why don't he flip over to 106.38? Okay. And he can read where the, the, the evil Egyptian king had shed innocent blood. If, if they were born in sin, how could they be innocent? Well, that's true. That's true. Well, or, uh, flip over there where Jesus was talking about, unless you become as one of these little ones, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Right. That's like saying, that's like saying, unless you're a sinner, you can't go to heaven. Right. All right. Well, I, well listen, I, I appreciate your call. Okay. I appreciate Thank your you. call. Bye -bye. Yeah, see, we're talking about choice now. Now, listen, let's think about this. If if you have a ch if you don't have a choice in things, let me get onto this this next uh, slide here. But if you don't have a choice in the matter, what does it what does it say uh, about things like this? Now, I think everybody's been watching this. Everybody's been watching this. And uh, now, this lady right here. Now, I think everybody thinks she killed her daughter, but she wants she got all free. Now, why don't we just make the argument? Well, she didn't have a choice in the matter. She, if she killed this little girl, it was just, God ordained it. it. It was her choice. It was her choice. All right. You want to word from the Lord? Hello? Hey. Now, now, oh, did I just hang up on him? Well, I just didn't have a choice. God, God made me do it. Sorry about that. You know, well, I don't know why I'm sorry. It was, I didn't have a choice in the matter. See? I just couldn't help it. I just couldn't help it. It was foreordained that I was going to hang up on that guy. So anyway, well, friends, if you don't have a choice in salvation, it seemed to me that you wouldn't have a choice in, in other things. I mean, the most important thing in your life is your soul salvation, and Mr. Hopkins is telling us that you don't have a choice in it. 
well, you know what? Then I must not have a choice if I'm going to eat a hamburger or not. When I go to the restaurant and I order, has God ordained that that's what I'm going to eat? Well, if that's the case, why do I eat so much junk food? See? Oh, well, that's the Lord ordaining that. Come on, people. So you mean to tell me that the most important thing about our, our existence here is our soul salvation and God doesn't give us a choice in how we're going to deal with it? He's not going to give us a choice on whether we're going to accept the grace and the salvation and the mercy that's been extended to us? Friends, Mr. Hopkins not getting a reward. He has not proven his point. But just keep this in mind. It gets better. We've got two more pages to go through. And next week, we've got a DVD that he sent in. We're going to look at that too. Oh, it's going to get better. Next week, Lord willing, on a word from the Lord and then on the religious review, we're going to go through this DVD. And I guess it must have been ordained that we're going to do it because that's what we're going to do. So must be God's will that we do it. Friends, I hope you see the point that we do have a part of our salvation. It is something that we have to do, and that is keep the commandments that God has given. God says a person must hear the gospel and believe. They must repent of their sins. They must confess that Christ is the Son of God and then be baptized for the remission of their sins. That's not something we devise. That's what God has said to do. And if you're going to be obedient to him, you're going to have to do it. Sorry, but you do have a choice in the matter. And if we can assist you in making that choice and obedience to God, we want to do that. I want to remind you, stay tuned for uh, a religious review after the, after the news. Like we said, we're going to let uh, Mark Childry get a little FaceTime in there and then stay tuned for the news. And until next week, I'm James Ofield saying, Always ask, what does the Bible say? You'll always get a word from the Lord. Then you can do your own religious review.